He's one of the survivors of the attack on the plane from Amsterdam to Detroit, Michigan, a couple Christmases ago, and he witnessed some things that are incredible. You see, they're now announcing the jury selection for the underwear bomber, and the underwear bomber doesn't want his lawyers to represent him. And Mr. Haskell has been there at the trial. He himself is a lawyer, and, well, he has, again, some information that is bombshell, to say the least. He will be joining us today, and he's also going to tell us what the uh, lawyers uh, for the underwear bomber uh, are now thinking is really going on. This is breaking news coming up today. But first off, you've heard about Big Sis and the giant telescreens everywhere in the aftermath of the underwear bomber. Uh, the the 9,000 locations of malls and Walmart saying don't trust anybody but government. Um, of course, don't trust anybody but the police state. And now, of course, they've got TV ads on uh, saying don't trust your neighbors and Al-Qaeda is everywhere and rebranding and over to the Tea Party and anybody who's a libertarian. Well, now they're going to pay uh, coffee shops and transit facilities and others uh, to put the little uh, sleeve that goes on the coffee so you don't burn your hand, little cardboard uh, hand holder, uh, to have a classically Orwellian uh, archetypal uh, all-seeing eye staring at you saying, if you see something, say something. So the message is, you're being watched, you're a terrorist, and at the same time, don't trust anybody else. Everybody is a terrorist. And of course, this is the exact message you would expect to get from the very people that are indeed the terrorists. You see, 10 years after 9-11, things are only going to get worse. More groping, more checkpoints with TSA-trained goons grabbing your wife's breasts and your child's genitals at the NFL football game. Not less. The more liberty you give up, the more tyranny you will live under. The American people, over 85%, are sick and tired of the private Federal Reserve and want it abolished. I've seen polls of close to 90% against Rick Perry's attempt to force Gardasil shots. USA Today, 85% against the TSA. I tell you, I talk to people on the street, it's more like 98%. I've talked to reporters at local TV stations, and they've got to go down and do an interview, and they're told, find somebody who supports the TSA and what they're doing. They've got to interview 40-plus people to find one person that supports it. In fact, that's an idea for tomorrow. A man on the street in Austin will get into the TSA at the airports. But now they're expanding out, as we've already covered, to the NFL. Now, what was the latest stunt of the TSA and the naked body scanner manufacturers and those that make money from it, like Chertoff? It was promoting naked body scanners now a year and a half ago when the Christmas Day underwear bomber struck. Well, it was Kurt Haskell and, of course, his wife, both lawyers, who witnessed the sharp-dressed man getting him on the plane without the passport. And a month and a half later, the State Department came out and said, well, it is true uh, that an unnamed U.S. agency asked us to help him get a visa. This is bombshell information. This is much bigger than Fast and Furious. They just re released audio recordings of the ATF trying to cover up. They were shipping guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment. Another false flag attack on this country's rights. And this is the guy in the face of media scrutiny and the FBI visiting him and the media saying, oh, this, this Haskell guy, you know, he's off in left field. Well, it all turned out to be true. And then other witnesses stepped forward on the other issues. So with us is Kurt Haskell uh, to look at the aftermath of how this has been used to further uh, chop America up, basically, and turn it into a police state because, well, the trial of the underwear bomber, and Mr. Haskell's a lawyer, so he can speak to this with some expertise, has now just gotten ready to begin, and he joins us. Thank you so much, sir, for being on with us. Hey, Alex. Good to be back. Well, my friend, you know, I've always got a lot of points I want to make, but you've got the floor. You want to recap the historical thing you witnessed with the uh, underwear uh, firecracker bomber? that we all have to run in fear of, or do you want to get into the latest information you've uh, garnered? It, it, you know, it's up to you, Alex. Do you have, do you have a preference? Where do you want to start? Uh, let's uh, start wherever you'd like. Okay. Well, I guess we'll start with what, what I saw in Amsterdam, in case someone's watching or listening that doesn't know who I am. Uh, 
you know, back in on Christmas Day 2009, my wife Lori and I were traveling back from Africa, passing through uh, Amsterdam on our way to Detroit, sitting at the gate playing cards, and uh, I saw an Indian man around age 50 wearing a tan suit, walking with, uh, looked like an African teenager who had on uh, jeans and a white t-shirt, didn't have a coat, didn't have any bags. So remember, we're in the middle of winter and Amsterdam's pretty cold. It's about as cold as it is uh, around here in Detroit in winter. And, uh, you know, I thought they were an odd pair. So I watched them as we were playing cards. They went up to the, the desk together, talked to the security airline worker who was working there. Just the, um, the Indian man spoke and he said, this man needs to board the flight, but he doesn't have a passport. And then the, uh, the worker said, well, you have to have a passport to get on the flight. And the Indian man then said, well, he's from Sudan. We do this all the time. And then she uh, referred them down a hallway, which was still in a secure area, and said, you need to go talk to a manager down the hallway. And, uh, you know, at the time, it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know who these people were, meant absolutely nothing. But a few hours later, as we were coming, to, coming down to land in Detroit on our flight, the African man tried to detonate a bomb on our plane. And he's subsequently known as the underwear bomber. Um, you know, I was pretty stunned after we landed, and I, and I noticed that it was the same guy. And I, I uh, leaned over Lori, and I said, hey, I think maybe I've seen something important here. And right after we got off the plane, uh, the first chance I got, I told the story to the FBI, and I've repeated it hundreds of times since. And obviously, the media doesn't want to cover it. The government doesn't want to hear it. And, uh, you know, I've been stonewalled by everybody, pretty much, except you and a few other um, people in the media that want the story out there. But, you know, that's what has gotten me. Uh, known, and that's why you want to talk to me, I'm sure. Well, the bombshell, though, is, and it came out with the Detroit Free Press and a few other places, but got no national coverage, that what the Undersecretary of State said, yeah, we were asked, quote, by an unnamed U.S. agency to get him a visa, and then here he is without the passport and stuff being gotten on the plane. I mean, this is incredible. About an hour after it happened, I, it was Christmas Day, I was going to get eggs at the local corner store for my wife, and... An hour after it happened, they were already saying, don't worry, we're not going to put scanners in. And they were behaving as if they just decided to do this. But I had remembered that they'd purchased them and, well, started the order for them a year before. So it was a complete rollout. I mean, it had all the signs of a PR uh, event, and that's always a telltale when something staged. And then more and more began to come out, and then others described him as looking disheveled. Uh, I think you described him as kind of out of it. And, and so many times... It now turns out Amor al Fox News, AP, Reuters, all report, number three in Al-Qaeda, the underwear bomber that uh, you had a, a, a visit with with a little pop in his pants or whatever you, uh, it was you and others saw and heard. Uh, you've got uh, the Times Square attacker. Uh, you've got the Fort Hood shooter. Uh, you've got so many others who he handles, basically, as, as, as their connection. The CIA told Congress, we won't let you have his two years of emails to Major Hassan at Fort Hood. And then we learn he's secretly hanging out at the Pentagon while he's on the most wanted list, number three in Al-Qaeda. And now, just last week, the State Department won't release under national security their records of the supposed number three of Al-Qaeda. I mean, at a certain point, Kurt, this is getting a little too obvious. And I know you like, as a lawyer and as an American, to... You know, just stick to the facts, man, like the guys from Dragnet. But at a certain point, I mean, this is as staged as a $3 bill when the handler of this guy who supposedly almost killed you and your wife uh, is being handled by a guy hanging out secretly with the Secretary of the Army. What's your view on that? Well, you know, Alex, I've been on your show, I think, four or five times now. But the first two or three times I came on, I wasn't drawing these conclusions yet. I'm sure your listeners remember when I was on and, you know, I wanted to stick to the facts and have the case build up to where uh, I actually believed what you're saying, that this was an intentional government plot. And at some point there became enough evidence where I uh, 
I firmly agree with you that this was definitely a stage plot by the U.S. government. And I think any of your listeners that are having doubts to that, I think the best evidence of that is to go on the Internet and Google Patrick Kennedy underwear bomber testimony and watch the video of the Undersecretary of the State Department, Patrick Kennedy, as he squirms in his testimony at Congress, trying every which way to not admit that this was an intentional plot. I think it's very telling. Just watch how he acts. It's obvious he's trying to hide what we all know, those of us that are paying attention, and this was a stage plot by the U.S. government, and there's a lot of evidence that supports that. Um, not a stage plot with a bomb, but with a defective bomb. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that this bomb could not have even detonated because it lacked a blasting cap. And I've had discussions with Umar's, Umar, the, uh, I'll call him Umar, the underwear bomber, his standby attorney, Anthony Chambers, who has indicated to me and even made a statement to the Detroit Free Press in December 2010 that the own experts the government has hired have indicated to him that the bomb could not have exploded, that it was impossibly defective. So how do you justify that with the uh, supposed story of what happened, that he flew you know, to Yemen, had this bomb sewn in his underwear, traveled back to Nigeria, to Amsterdam, to Detroit, or whatever We've it was. seen this footage they've released where he's got the hood on, and it looks like bad 70s uh, or 1980 Empire Strikes Back with Obi-Wan Kenobi when he's the ghost. I mean, it's flickering, put into the black. I mean, we're video people, and it's pretty easy to see that that's fake. Like the Bin Laden videos, all of it, it's turned out those are fake. This is really getting insane. And, and let's just say it's real, though. Land of the free, home of the brave. We've got to give up all our rights and have our children groped, our wives groped, checkpoints, uh, TSA at proms, because a guy had a, a bomb go off. And I'm going from memory since I first interviewed you a year and a half ago, but uh, did you even hear anything go off? Yeah, yeah. Uh... It was quiet, though. It was more like pop, 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 pretty quiet. And, uh, you know, it was mostly scream, a lot of screaming. And what really got my attention was the fire. Obviously, I was watching the fire because this wasn't just a, you know, a bomb that malfunctioned. It could start at a fire. And that's what had me worried. The fire was spreading really quick. And then so we haven't I, even gotten into the part where you land and the guy that's videotaping this is taken off. And they say there's bombs. Get out of here. And then later, forget it. That never happened. I mean, clearly, there is a textbook cover-up going on here. And it's funny the State Department's involved, because studying and, and reading books by former Navy SEALs like Richard Marcinko and others uh, from the uh, uh, rogue team that he was part of, and talking to a lot of people in black ops, and the British have admitted they do this, they will stage dud bombs or flashbang attacks on their own embassies or on their own diplomatic cars from time to time. If they, most governments do this, if they want to get the staff more serious about security, if they want to get more funding. And this this dud bomb event uh, run by the same guy, Alaki, where the person's trying to light his shoe on fire when, when everybody knows plastic explosive is not lit, it's an electrical charge. I mean, it's the same thing. And even mainstream media in the last year has had to cover all the fake patsies that they recruit out of prison who who are terrorists, mentally ill, addled, normally mildly retarded, who who the FBI doesn't infiltrate, they lead them and offer them hundreds of thousands of dollars if they'll bomb the Christmas tree in Portland or if they'll attack this or that. So 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 clearly they're trying to manufacture these events. Kurt Haskell, uh, where do you see this country going? What's your overall view? on the fact that there's big sis at the football games and uh, big telescreens going up saying watch your neighbor and, and, and see something, say something with eyeballs on it, on coffee cups. I mean, it's like we've woken up in 1984. Yeah, you, you know, I could go on and on for hours about this, Alex. <laughs> I have so much to say about it. But, uh, you know, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, this country is going downhill. It, it's time to leave this country. It's only going to get worse. Voting's not going to make it better. Those of you that are holding out for Ron Paul to win the presidency, forget it. It's not going to make a difference even if he wins. Uh, this country is not going to change. It's gone too far unless, uh, I'm not calling for this, but I'm saying the only thing that would stop it would be an overthrow of the government, in my opinion. This country is too far gone, keeps getting worse and worse all the time. There's no stopping it. The media is complicit. The, everyone in the government is complicit. It's a complete disaster. 
Um, you know, and speaking of the NFL, interestingly enough, I didn't know TSA was getting involved in the NFL, and I actually had tickets and went to the game Sunday, uh, Kansas City Chiefs versus Detroit Lions, and I got there 17 minutes before kickoff, and I didn't get in before kickoff because of all the pat-downs that were going on. Oh. I was kind of excited. Uh, I missed about the first five minutes of the game. But um, a, a point I wanted to make a minute ago, which – I haven't talked to you about it yet because I haven't been on your show since earlier this year, but there was a hearing I went to in the underwear bomber case on July 7th and some, some pretty interesting things happened. Can I, do we have a minute where I can get into this? Absolutely. I've been bringing up a lot of history and past stuff. You've got the last five minutes. You've got the floor. You're going to the okay. hearings and that's why you're, you're, you're here. Yeah. So dispensing with the background, you've been going to the hearings. You're talking to the underwear uh, bombers, uh, lawyers. Uh, so you're giving us breaking inside info that the national media is not covering. So Kurt, you've got the floor. Tell us all about it. Yeah, I, I figured that out. I started going to hearings and then I would read the, the press reports about the hearings and they would be totally different than what I would see at the actual hearing. And one of them was uh, on July 7th. It was a hearing. The, this hearing was scheduled because the stand attorney, Umar standby attorney, asked to delay the trial. And he asked to delay the trial because he said he was uh, just before, and this would have been in June, so we're talking 18, 19 months after the bombing. He was just given uh, a, a great deal, uh, what he called the most significant evidence of the case. And he asked for some additional time to go through and hire experts and to delay the trial, which is set for a few days from now, starting October 4th. But he then went on to describe the evidence he was just given. And I think it's pretty interesting. If you think about what my theory on the case is that an undercover agent uh, from the U.S. government gave Umar an intentionally defective bomb and escorted him through security. That's what really happened here. So keep that in mind with what the evidence was that he was given at the last minute. A copy of Umar's passport. He was given a disk containing a chemical analysis of the bomb, airport security video and audio, uh, four disks of DNA analysis. I'm not really sure of what, but that's what he said. And then the last one was a witness statement from a, I'll go over this slow because it's kind of confusing, a Dutch non-law enforcement citizen government profiler who talked to Umar during the time in question. So what I make out of this, Dutch Okay, non-law enforcement. Okay, government profiler. Kind of weird. Who could this be? Psychologist. During the time in question. I think this is the sharp-dressed man, and I think the sharp-dressed man was the per a person at the airport uh, in um, Amsterdam. They have a, an additional level of security, that being a security interview of some sort, after you go through, you know, metal detectors. That's Israeli so style, I isn't it? Yeah, so I'll repeat that again. Dutch, okay. Um, Non-law enforcement, okay. He's not law enforcement, he's a profiler. Government profiler, okay. Who talked to Umar during the time in question. Okay, so Chambers is being dumped at the last minute, this statement from this guy, along with a passport, uh, airport security video and audio, and a chemical analysis of the bomb. Now, why was all this evidence withheld for 18 or 19 months? to give him the least amount of time to go through it and hire experts to, uh, to testify at trial over this evidence. Wait, I've got to wow. go back, though. This is so bombshell, because right. this is what you said originally. Only right. some type of high-level security person could get someone on a plane. And, 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 and going back, the, the gate person was arguing at first, and he basically dropped the hammer, and I'm the boss, and boom, he gets on. Only senior security could do that, and and uh, I've looked it up, you've looked it up, you're right, they have that additional humet or uh, uh, level where a profiler can interview you, and only security could bypass and intimidate a gate person into, into not doing their job. You have it right there. And we know the State Department, months after you first documented it, admits that they were basically ordered to help uh, get him through. So we have them. My God, Kurt, this is incredible. And thank God you were there. And none of it was reported in the media. But it, it was even worse than that, because Chambers was clearly irritated over this. He has to delay the trial, right? And there was a whole hearing over this. But then he said, 
you know, how can I even be sure I have all the evidence now, Judge? You know, I'm going to ask that if there's any other evidence that it be turned over to me immediately so I can at least look at that before the trial. And what, you know, what I would expect the government to say is, oh, you know, we gave you everything already. That's not what they said. What they said was, we have some other evidence that's secret. I think they said secret. I don't think they said top secret, but they said, we have some other secret evidence and we're not giving it to you until Judge Edmonds looks at it and decides if you should have it. And Judge Edmonds then said, well, I'll look at it and I'll decide if you can have it within the next two weeks. Wow, so the so, headline should have been in the New York Times. Like it should have been the New York the Times. Secret evidence being withheld in underwear bomber trial. Uh, bomb, but no, 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 it's just there's no news about this. Right, and you know, why, let's say, okay, you believe the official story. He's some kind of crazy lunatic Al-Qaeda guy, whatever. Why is there secret government evidence being hidden from the defense in this case? Why? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's well, it's clear, Kurt. I'm going to have to have you on the radio slash Skype as well on the uh, daytime show 11 to 2 in the next few days. This is so incredible. And, and, and hopefully we can interview you as the trial progresses. But other bombshells sure. from your court watching, what have his lawyers told them? Have you tried to say, hey, look for this angle. This is the M.O. of how they set people up. Yeah, you know, I, I've met with his, he doesn't have a lawyer. Remember, he fired his lawyers. All he has is a standby lawyer, which is, uh, in layman terms, it's a helper, okay? But Umar still gets to make all the decisions. So I've talked to his standby attorney, I don't know, five, six different times. And I actually met with him for a few hours in his office one day. And I, I said, you know, I, I want to make sure you know what really happened here. And, and you know, uh, this is my blog, and make sure you read all my posts and evidence I had. And he said, um, yeah, we've been reading your blog, and we've been getting our defense theories on the case from your blog. So I, to me, that was kind of flattering. No, but, you were uh, there. You're an eyewitness. Right. Uh, and he said, basically, you know, we didn't even know some of these things. We're not getting these details from Umar. And, uh, you know, it gives us a whole new angle on the case. We didn't even think of this uh, entrapment defense at all until we read your blog. But that being said, he told me that, again, standby attorney, this was six months ago or so, you know, we totally expect that we'll be, that him and his firm would be the full attorneys on the case and not stand by it by the time trials happen. Now, that hasn't happened. He's still representing himself, which to me, tells me one thing he's in on this too now how he became umar i'm talking about how he became in on this cover-up i don't know but well, well it's like mcveigh i've talked to lawyers involved experts police they basically told him you do this your whole family's dead that's one of the oldest tricks in the book they can also get a mentally ill person tell them they're a secret agent and then threaten them i think you'll find this is basically a playbook that they follow, and when you see the telltale signs and then confirm them, there it is again. What, what does the defense think or the standby lawyer? What, do, what, did, what does your gut tell you as a survivor of this, Kurt? What does your wife think? As far as the defense? No, I mean, what do you, th what do you think's going on with Mutalib? Okay, I think he's in on it. Now, I'm not sure whether this happened recently or he's been in on it all along and he could be in on it by being promised his release you know maybe they'll send him to guantanamo bay and release him i don't know or it could be a threat or it could be torture i don't know you know i asked his standby attorney that question and he didn't really know either all he said was you know i i haven't seen any evidence or heard anything that he's being tortured but america does it torture oh i forgot we do it's the new virtue <laughs> yeah but you know if if uh, Anthony Chambers was running this case, which he's not, he told me the defense would be entrapment and I would be one of the main witnesses at the trial. Obviously, that hasn't happened. It's well, standby happen. lawyer says the defense would be entrapment. So that's that's being looked at. My God, this is incredible. But he's he doesn't have a say so. Remember, he's only standby right now. So Umar is calling the shots. So, and I obviously I believe that's intentional. And what I, I'm seeing now is the last hearing 
which I think was uh, 9 15, September 15. I, I couldn't make it to that one. I had some hearings of my own I couldn't get out of. But uh, there were reports in the media that Umar was acting crazy, refusing to button up his shirt, refusing to stand when the judge came out and he came into the courtroom yelling, Osama is alive. Okay, to me, that tells me one thing. Uh, every time I've seen Umar, he's been very calm, reserved, very soft spoken, not acting crazy at all. So to me, he's been told to act crazy, act crazy throughout the trial. Yeah, that was in the news. That was in the yeah. news that he did all that. Right, exactly. That's totally opposite. Which is another telltale sign. All this other bombshell stuff, the horror media, the complicit globalist media, the crime syndicate media, they don't cover it, but now they cover the outburst because it fits into the new legend. Well, I think he's being told to do this because otherwise people paying attention now for the trial would say, well, who's this guy? He doesn't seem very scary. He's just this small, reserved little guy. You know, I think they're telling him that crazy so it can be put it in the headlines, you know, he did this, this day or that. And that's why he's representing himself, too. So the real story won't get out. But. Well, Kurt, this is too incredible. And the nightly news is going way over. Definitely, I need to get you on the radio in the next few days. Uh, uh, quickly, quickly, just give us a preview. What else have you learned? Um, you know, though I hit the main points already. I think um, I'm going to know a lot more soon. The... Um, Jury selection happens October 4th, and we have opening statements uh, starting October 11th. So I think you're going to start hearing a lot more, and I'm going to be able to tell you a lot more. Though, you know, those were the main things that I've hit recently, but of course, there's so much to the story I can't really. Oh, tell it's going to take a long time for me to even be able to digest this. I'm going to have to rewatch this interview several times. Uh, as we end the uh, broadcast here, Kurt, please stay there. I want to get you set up right now for the radio show. Obviously, as soon as you can, you're a very busy man. Uh, you have a lot of courage, and we just appreciate your time. Uh, I understand why. Well, well, in closing, correct me if I'm wrong. You sound now not so much shaken, but uh, you're realizing that that the rabbit hole goes very deep. I mean, for you to say, look, this country's done, it's cooked, stick a fork in it. The problem is this country's been seized by this global corporate crime syndicate and it's being used to take over the whole world, so there's nowhere to run. And believe me, I've thought about this a lot. I'm getting chills right now. We've got to fight these people. But, but it, certainly 18 months ago, you were not committed. You just said, I saw this, it's suspicious, it should be investigated. Now what you said has been confirmed by the State Department. You've watched the cover-up. You've watched all this other evidence, and now you're really facing it. I think as other Americans have the experience you've had, in that is our hope. And as people in government and media, it's time for them to decide what side they're on. Which This is not like we're just working with Boss Hogg here and, ha-ha, it's some corruption, good old boy stuff. This is really nasty, targeting our basic liberties and freedoms. The question is why? Because the foreign banks have imploded the country, and they know when we find out that we have been robbed, if we say, no, we don't owe these derivatives, they're going to all go to jail. But if they can put a dictatorship in of this oligarchy, of this police state, we're going to be their slaves. So this is all the marbles. This is everything on the table, Kurt. And, uh, I mean, I know I'm ranting here at the end, but this is one of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. Uh, in 60 seconds, your comments on what I just said. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you, Alex. You know, I, witnessing the story from the inside out, I've seen how it's played out over the past year and a half. And, you know, I was just a regular guy when this happened. I was, was nobody. I didn't really have the extreme thoughts of the government or anything. And, you know, but these are thoughts I've developed over the past 20 months, doing my research, talking to people, talking to uh, Umar standby attorney going to court hearings talking and talking to other passengers. Yeah, his standby lawyers think the same thing. He does. Now, he he's kind of hesitant to go out and say that, but you may yeah. see that come out during the trial. I don't know exactly how much input he'll have, but if he has his way, this is going to be the case. I'm skeptical that will happen, but yeah, I've developed these thoughts over the past 20 months. They're entirely justified. They're backed by my eyewitness count, other evidence I've come into. And, you know, if you don't like what I have to say, I, I'm sorry. But if you would do all the research that I've done, I think you would come to the same conclusion. Uh, and 
I, I think the USA is finished. Well, I yeah. hope you're wrong because we don't have anywhere to run. Believe me, if there was some place to go free of these people, I'd go there. Uh, this is the only ship we've got, and it's on fire, but all the other ships are on fire. Kurt Haskell, we appreciate your courage and glad you're here reporting for us. Uh, you're a victim. You're somebody who could have been killed by this, but you've, you've, you've certainly uh, had a lot of courage, and I know your wife has uh, as well. I'm sorry, your yes. Skype's gotten a little bit delayed. Say it again. Sorry, Alex. I said I could have been killed by the fire, but not by the bomb. The bomb couldn't have detonated, but you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Kurt Haskell, thank you so much. We'll talk to you very soon. No problem. Oh, man.